I think finally things are happening for Sjogren's in terms of therapeutics. Sjogren's is a lot like lupus. It's been very hard to make inroads, but I think we're going to get there. That's Dr. Arthur Bookman, coordinator of the multidisciplinary Sjogren's Clinic at Toronto Western Hospital. He is also an associate professor at the University of Toronto, where he is the program director for the Division of Rheumatology. He is a former president of the Canadian Rheumatology Association, the current president of the Journal of Rheumatology, and co-chair of the Medical Advisory Committee of the Sjogren Society of Canada. He's our guest on this episode of Around the Room for our long-promised and finally delivered episode on Sjogren's disease. Welcome, I'm Daniel Ennis, back with my co-host, Dr. Janet Pope. How are you, Janet? Good. How are you, Daniel? I'm pretty good, thanks. Uh, Good to have you back. Yeah, it's good to be back. Awesome. Well, before we get to our guest, I want to announce some upcoming episodes on a whole bunch of interesting topics. Uh, We have another French episode with host Dr. Hugues allard Chamard, looking at ultrasonography in rheumatology. We're also going to be working on a medical mysteries episode for you. If you have questions you would like answered by the experts, please get in touch through the CRA Twitter account. That's at C-R-A-S-C-R room or by email info at room.ca. And for future Medical Mysteries episodes, please get in touch if you have challenging cases you want to present on the podcast. So without further ado, now on with the show and our guest, Dr. Arthur Bookman. Welcome. Thank you, Daniel. How are you? Doing great. How are you, Janet? Ditto. (laughs) We've been looking forward to having a conversation with you for for quite some time because um, Sjogren's is, is something that even though we bump into relatively frequently, I think it's something that through training, I may have learned shockingly little about. Um, and so before we start with the Sjogren's interrogation, I was hoping you could frame the conversation with a bit of autobiography. How did you end up working in the field of Sjogren's disease? Well, I, I was doing general rheumatology uh, and had just uh, moved into Toronto Western Hospital uh, when one of the eye doctors, uh, Alan Slomovic, uh, came down to speak to me, and he said he had all these patients with Sjogren's syndrome, and he had no idea how to manage them or what to do with them. They had all sorts of different problems, and was I interested in setting up a Sjogren's clinic? So I said, yes, uh, uh, but we have to involve multiple disciplines, and then we held a meeting of an ENT specialist, we got an optometrist involved, and we got the uh, fellows who were working at the School of Dentistry in oral pathology involved, and we managed to set up a schedule which my secretary absolutely hated <laughs> for all the years that she did it until she retired. Uh, but uh, uh, it, was, it was worth the work, and we set it up to collect data uh, on the patients and to be able to study people in a uniform manner. Maybe we can then jump right in to how, how you actually begin to approach Sjogren, so really from the diagnosis perspective. Um, so walk me through how you, in your clinic, diagnose Sjogren's and how diagnosis is distinct from classification criteria, where I think a lot of us lean on that for making a diagnosis, and maybe we shouldn't. Well, I, I'm not sure that we shouldn't. Um, I think there's exceptions, and not every case of that you know darn well is Sjogren's uh, fits classification criteria, uh, but they are helpful. I, of course, take the usual history and do the usual physical examination, but um, one of my pet peeves is the fact that nobody in practice actually measures uh, Shermer's test or does an unstimulated salivary flow test. And you really can't tell if somebody's got Sjogren's unless you actually measure that they've got a deficit of saliva production or tear production. If they don't, uh, even with a positive anti SSA antibody, the only thing left to you to do is a biopsy. And it's, I would say, in 80% of, of the cases, you can clinch the diagnosis just by doing those two simple examinations uh, and having positive serology, uh, along, of course, with a good history. But, you know, we found in our Sjogren's Clinic, we did this analysis of over 700 patients. We correlated the objective findings of dry eyes and dry mouth 
with the severity of their complaints graded on a visual analog score uh, and the type of complaints that they had. And we found that there was a not bad correlation uh, for dry mouth uh, with a correlation coefficient around 0.45, which is like in the middle, you know, like no correlation at zero, perfect correlation is one. But for dry eyes, the correlation coefficient was 0.27. So like there was hardly any correlation. We had people who said they absolutely had dry eyes and they had perfectly normal Schirmer's tests. And we had people that said they had no symptoms at all and they had no tears. I think that that's the one pet peeve I have. And that's the one message I want to get across to people that are listening to this podcast. Can can I ask a question about that? Because I think 0.45 is not a great correlation, no. personally. It's not good, and 0.27 is terrible. Um, but do you go on, if there is a, a history, maybe you've done a Schirmer's or done both those tests for dry eyes, dry mouth, do you ever go on to do a lip biopsy or a, like a minor salivary gland biopsy, or is that pretty darn rare? Yeah, so... Uh, of course, in our children's clinic, we were doing it on everybody because it was part of the protocol. But in true clinical practice, I can't say that I do it on everybody. So I always ask myself the question as to what difference is it going to make when I get the biopsy. So if I have somebody who's got systemic disease, it's unexplained. Uh, often they've got like a positive SSA antibody and they... I've had people with pulmonary fibrosis, people with peripheral neuropathy. They're SSA positive, but they don't have any evidence of dry eyes and dry mouth. So, you know, that kind of case, I find the minor salivary gland biopsy would tip me towards using immunosuppressants and maybe even being able to include them in clinical trials. Uh, so those, it, it would be important under those circumstances. Um, but I have other people where it's a slam dunk to make the diagnosis clinically, and I don't feel I need the biopsy because even if it was negative, I wouldn't change my mind. You know, following up on some of those uh, points that have just been brought up, I'm curious if we can talk a, just a little bit about like the sensitivity specificity of maybe those three. So unstimulated salivary flow, Schirmer's test, and biopsy you know, we don't have to give, you know, precise numbers, but I'm curious kind of how how useful these tests are um, because you pointed out um, earlier on, that, you know, salivary flow and Schirmer's, these are very easy tests that can be done in clinic. Maybe I can get you to comment on uh, pitfalls afterwards, but, you know, how useful are each of these tests on their own? Well, so on their own, they're of no use whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> you want to put them together in a package. And that's where... Uh, that's where I find the ACR criteria useful. When I when I want to pick my way through the wheat, you know, like I've got somebody who says, you know, I got dry eyes, my dentist says my teeth are falling apart, I'm sure I've got Sjogren's syndrome, right? And then uh, they may or may not come in with positive serology. So uh, maybe I look at them and I find they've got bad teeth and maybe they do have Sjogren's. So I'll do, a, I'll do those two tests, and that may decide, make up my mind as to whether I need the biopsy or not. Or mm -hmm. I may already know that that may convince me that they've got Sjogren's. And, and let's say in the, in the situation where, you know, because these tests seem to kind of be about turning a subjective symptom of dryness into an objective finding that we can kind of pursue or, or at least kind of hold on to. If you have a negative Schirmer's and a neg and a normal unstimulated salivary flow, uh, you know, let's say positive serology or negative serology, can any of these tests rule out the diagnosis, or do you also is that a point where you would need biopsy to rule out as best as you can a diagnosis? Well, you know, you have to have either a biopsy or a positive anti antibody anti SSA antibody to make a diagnosis like, uh, according to criteria, according to criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you, if you don't have either of those, there's no point doing anything, right? <laughs> Fair uh, enough. So uh, you've pretty well ruled out Sjogren's if both are negative. Um, but like, here's a case scenario I've, I run into. Uh, somebody will uh, come to see me that's uh, anti-SSA positive, 
and they have a history of definite peritonitis, like it's it's a slam dunk history, and yet you measure their tears and saliva, and they're normal, right? That's so. Those people I know have Sjogren's. So if I really, if 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 it's going to lead me to be able to use an immunosuppressant or maybe one of the trial drugs that we're doing, so it might be worth my while to get a biopsy. So let's make sure that I'm actually doing these tests right. So for a Schirmer's test or an unstimulated salivary flow, what are some of the pitfalls um, that you see, you know, trainees or even uh, staff rheumatologists doing? Okay, so uh, you need uh, a piece. You, you actually don't have to buy the Shermer's test, but you can. It's on Amazon. You can buy it. Uh, but you can make it yourself. It's uh, like filter paper, Wattman Type 2 filter paper, 5 millimeters wide, 35 millimeters long. You fold it at one end, and you put the little tab at the end in your eye between the middle and the outer third of the lower lid. So you put it here uh, and the other side. You have the patient close their eyes. Uh, that's the standard way of doing it, eyes closed. Uh, it stays in for five minutes, and then uh, you pull the eyelid down to pull it out. Otherwise, you'll tear the paper, and you have to go fishing for it, right? So you pull the eyelid down, you pull it out, and then... Uh, you measure from the fold distally. And when you're measuring, you measure to the place where the tear, wet, the wetness goes across the complete five millimeter width of paper. So, because often it's uneven. So you yeah. go back to where it goes right across the paper. That's the point at which you measure. So, and if you have two eyes that are different and one meets the criteria and one doesn't, you take the one that meets the criteria as the standard. That's that's by convention, okay? And they're half dry. Yeah, some people are. <laughs> I have had people <laughs> who right. half dry. Uh, and uh, yeah, those are those are the main pitfalls. So you want five millimeters or less is an abnormal Schirmer's test. So then for the unstimulated salivary flow. <clears throat> uh, if you want to do this in the office, it's really like it's not entirely standard for clinical trial, but it's good enough. You get one of those specimen collection jars, you know, one the one they put urine in, the plastic ones. You give it to the patient. You, you tell the patient that they're going to be left alone for five minutes. You tell them when to start and you leave them alone. You'd, if there's people in the room, you get them out because they get nervous. They don't want to spit with people in front of them. They just make sure they're alone. And you tell them to drool into the paper. They don't want to suck saliva out. Just drool into the cup until you tell them time's up. In five minutes, time is up. You get a disposable syringe with a maybe 21 gauge needle and you just suck up the saliva and you measure the volume in the syringe. It's that easy. So some people have foamy saliva, and it's impossible. But for most people, you can do it. And you don't have to touch anything. You don't have to get your hands wet. And you just throw it all out when you're done. And that's it, right? And do you have to cancel on, you know, do, or do you have to adjust for, you know, when they ate, uh, drank, alcohol, smoking, or these things that you, you have to make sure, like, to make the test as pristine as possible? Are these things very important? Or, you, you know, you, you do it regardless of, kind of what what they've been up to before they came to clinic so again if you're in a clinical trial yeah you'd be doing it in the morning they're not allowed to have anything to eat etc for an hour before they do the test and they can't wet their mouth before they start they have to just do it right in the office you take what you can get so janet are you uh... (laughs) i i know i i I do i I can honestly admit I haven't done a Shermer's in a long, long time, but I do look at SSA, SSB, Rowan Law, yeah. and the history and feel if their parotids are swollen and look to see if their tongue is dry. So I'm not doing the accurate stuff, but I've never done the salivary flow. So what would be the normal amount that someone should get? And is oh, it age, age adjusted? No, it's not age adjusted. And normal uh, is 0.1 ml per minute, 0.1 ml per minute. 
it. So you do it for five minutes, and so then you just divide. Five. Yeah, you just just divide your volume by five, and get, that gives you the amount per minute. And that is so you record it as the amount per minute. So anything at point point one mL or less is abnormal. Anything greater than point one mL is nor is not a criterion. Daniel, do you do these tests? Uh, you be I, honest. <laughs> I, I actually do. So I, I, um, I think I'm a lot less busy than you, Janet. So I, I have the, the five minutes a piece for the uh, Shermers and the unstimulated salivary flow, um, and I actually, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you brought it up. I do run into bubbly saliva, and uh, I, I really don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so that's why, like in clinical trials, they do it by weight. You know, uh, okay. That, that's why they don't do my my method. But <laughs> in clinical practice, I, I, you know, it's it, in most cases it works. You know, so I'm curious about this next piece, which is that as I came through training, I learned the content knowledge or, or some content knowledge around Sjogren's, but there w- there was always a little bit of nihilism, um, and that had to do with the fact that if someone's ex- exclusive complaint and physical finding. If you did the salivary flow or the Shermers, and yes, indeed, their symptom correlated with true pathologic dryness, you know, some people that I worked with would kind of point out, um, unless they have the other systemic manifestations of Sjogren's, the difference between having idiopathic or dryness for another reason and having Sjogren's related sicca is really their risk of lymphoma's down the road. That's going to be really the difference for me and this patient. My treatments are going to be the same. And so, you know, I never send for a lip biopsy. I never do an unstimulated salivary flow. It, it doesn't change anything. And I'm curious if you can kind of uh, approach that. Is, is that a fair, I, I suspect I know your answer, is that a fair assessment um, or, or is there value beyond um, just knowing the cosmic truth of someone's uh, the cause of dryness? Let me answer that from two perspectives. First of all, just the the straight practical issue. Say somebody presents you with dry mouth and they have Sjogren's syndrome. That individual who's got Sjogren's syndrome has a very high probability of having huge dental damage. Uh, And I mean like fragmentation of their teeth, uh, marginal caries, uh, and dental loss. And it's, it's a bit of a war, and you have to be on top of it right from the beginning. They have to be seeing a dentist four times a year, and they have to have very aggressive treatment if you're going to have any chance for them. That same person who doesn't have Sjogren's, who has the same amount of dryness, has nothing like very, very little uh, danger to their teeth. They do not have the same issues, not by a long shot. So it's not correlated just with dryness. The diagnosis makes a difference. As far as eyes are concerned, uh, the vast majority of people can be managed just with artificial tears, but it's mainly the Sjogren's patients that run into filamentary keratitis, corneal ulcers, and refractory disease. And knowing that it's Sjogren's, again, uh, will let you step up your game. Autologous, autologous serum tears, uh, uh, scleral contact lenses, uh, and uh, corneal bandages, and whatever else uh, that we've got. And there's uh, there's going to be more coming down the line, uh, uh, I can guarantee you. So that that's uh, from a practical point of view. The other thing is that what we're learning when we're doing clinical trials is that uh, people have a very impaired quality of life with true Sjogren's syndrome, uh, and it correlates with things that you don't necessarily look at as a clinician, such as the degree of inflammation that they have, like the measures of high gamma globulin, a high sedimentation rate, correlates with a tremendous sense of fatigue uh, and Again, I think that we're going to have agents that are going to be able to affect that and improve quality of life. And those are people that don't have uh, target organ damage, like, you know, uh, lung inflammation or peripheral neuropathies. 
So I, I think there's a certain practical importance to those things. And a patient would want to know, right? If you just say, oh, this is sicka, we're going to do the same thing either way. But I mean, I guess the pretest likelihood is that if they feel dry, even though the correlation isn't great, and they show a picture where they've had recurrent parotid gland swelling or some chronic submandibular change, and they're positive A and A, rho law, and their ESR is 100, I'm, I would still say, well, you need the dentist regularly, you need the ophthalmologist, and if we're going to do a clinical trial, then I have to do some fancy tests. So I, I would agree that we need to know, and I guess it's how much do you delve in. Yeah, well, I mean, you could say that about every disease. Yes, yep. <laughs> Before we move on to, to picking your brain about treatments, I, ha- I had some questions about the salivary gland biopsy. Um. You know, in certain settings, patients might be on prednisone, uh, and I'm curious how you find that affects the sensitivity or specificity of, of the biopsy. Yeah, I don't think it does very much. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I don't even think prednisone is that great for parotomegaly, or um, it, it, it doesn't have a big impact on the disease. Hmm. Okay. How often are you seeing patients who are, you know, SSA positive and they have other classic features of the disease and um, you've classified them as having Sjogren's and they actually still have a negative biopsy? Is that um, something that you bump into with some frequency or is that quite rare? Yeah, I mean, it happens. First of all, it's, uh, there's a sampling error. Uh, there's a ten, about a 10% negative biopsy rate in any clinical series. Um, and... I find that the more classical the patient, the more likely they are to have a positive biopsy. The ones that we are getting the negative biopsies are often the seronegative patients. Uh, and then what's well, good, it rules out the disease. I, I, I've seen, I don't know, Janet, if you've seen this too, but I've, I've seen in some patients who I really do think they have Sjogren's um, and they, they have a biopsy that shows nonspecific sialadenitis. Um, and I'm curious if, let's say, that person can't be classified as Sjogren's, let's say they have a negative SSA, um, can you later develop um, antibodies, or could the biopsy change later on? Like, are, you know, is there, are, is there some fraction of people who we are biopsying at an earlier stage of the disease, or are those fairly stable features over time? Maybe that's a, a difficult question to answer. It is. A, I don't have a lot of experience doing serial biopsies in patients, so I'm not sure I can answer that question. It's really hard to determine when people seroconvert, like most people seem to be anti-SSA positive forever, and they never turn negative. The biopsies, I don't know, I, I've never, I, I guess I've had the occasional patient where I've had a negative biopsy once and then it's come back positive. You're never sure whether it was just sampling, you know, how you right. did it. And then finally, it's it's important who interprets the biopsy and, of course, how well it's done. I've had people who have come to me with negative biopsies when I, or, I always order the specimen and I always get it reviewed. And so, sometimes it's been striated muscle, uh, it's, you know, uh, mucosal epithelium. So it's not always, doesn't always contain glandular material. And then we've had biopsies that have less than the necessary four millimeter square of tissue. You've got to have that to have an adequate biopsy. Otherwise, you can't score the specimen. So, Just to add one thing to that as well, I, I agree that I think Rho, Rho Law, SSA or SSA and SSB, I think really, really predate. And I always think by the time they're symptomatic, they've probably had lymphocyte infiltration there for a long, long time. So I'm always wondering if I did biopsy them and not knowing enough about, you know, a a true negative versus a false negative, and, unless if it's reviewed. I wonder if sometimes we're just getting a scarred up that the minor salivary glands, some of them you're not going to find as many, that they're um, atrophic over time, and you really need those lymphocytes to be there, I think, to make the diagnosis. Yeah. So they don't get scar tissue. Uh, they get uh, okay. they get atrophy. Atrophy. Uh, but usually, when they've got atrophy uh, in and around the intact sinai, you do get the full full size of lymphocytes and plasma cells. 
So sometimes so, uh, it's the it's the interpretation of the specimen too. Like uh, not every pathologist knows how to interpret it. We'll be back to Around the Room in a minute after this message from the CRA, who want to let you know about the Adverse Events Video-Based Accredited Learning Program. These modules have been designed for rheumatologists to improve their understanding of adverse events during the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. The resources are available exclusively to CRA members and invited guests on the CRA website. Access to the site is password protected. To receive your password, please contact info at room.ca. This program was supported by an unrestricted educational grant from BMS Canada. An independent CRA scientific planning committee was responsible for the scientific integrity, objectivity, and balance of this content. And now, back to Around the Room. If we can move on to treatment for a bit, I'd love to get, you know, I think most rheumatologists listening will have some expertise with some of the more basic treatments, but I'm curious if you can give us your kind of clinical pearls for for treating ocular and oral sicca. Okay, let's start with dry eyes because you can do more for that. So dry eyes, you know, we usually, of course, start with the artificial tears. uh, And it's important to tell people that they should use those uh, uh, like tear gel at night because a lot of people forget to do that. And it's important to tell people to use their artificial tears uh, at least two times a day and for true Sjogren's four times a day. Um, and the punctal plugs, of course, are the next measure that we still use. Uh, they are usually put in the lower lid puncta uh, and you got to, you, you, you don't want to, do that if somebody's got a normal Schirmer's test. That's that's one time when you want to do a Schirmer's test before you let them get them put in, because otherwise they walk away with overflow tearing all day. So right. uh, so you want them to have an abnormal Schirmer's test. The uh, our our cornea specialists actually put the punctal plugs in the upper puncta as well in severe cases. So that can be useful to know. And fitting the punctal plugs is really important if they're too big. They cause inflammation and problems. And if they're too small, they fall out. Um, so then after that, uh, we usually, of course, we use Restasis and Zedra. Uh, I don't know how good those preparations are. I think they're helpful maybe for the inflammation that arises from dry eyes and dry mouth. But they don't. I don't think they cause more tear production, really. Uh and then after after that, we go usually on to autologous serum tears. So there they draw the patient's blood. Usually usually you can get this done by compounding pharmacies. Uh, uh, and uh, so they, they divide the uh, serum into aliquots, and you put most of the aliquots into the freezer. You keep one in the fridge, and they use it until it runs out. So they're usually good for about three months, uh, and then they have to do it again. It costs somewhere between 150 and $300 to do it. Oof. After that, it's difficult to know what to do. Uh, Alan Slomovic, uh, who is the cornea specialist that I work with, is finding a lot of success now uh, with platelet-rich plasma. Uh, so he's been using that. He, he's just starting a trial on it, but he swears by it. He thinks it makes a big difference. So we'll see if that makes a big difference. Yeah, and then uh, the other thing that I find really, really helpful is enclosed glasses. So uh, you can actually buy them uh, on the internet. So these are glasses that prevent evaporation of your tears and prevent the air from getting to the eyes. They don't look bad, uh, and they're good for, you know, uh, watching TV, reading the paper. If you go to a movie and turn out the lights, put them on, you know. Um, so they can be very useful as well. So for dry mouth, um, uh, of course, uh, most patients in the end are relegated to using sips of water. Uh, there's a variety of artificial preparations uh, that I I would say are of dubious benefit. A lot of people like the biotin products, and so they use the spray during the day and the mouth rinse, and there's a gel 
they can use at night. And the uh, Xylemelts lozenges are, I, I find, are really a big hit with the Sjogren's patients. So they, those are these lozenges made of xylitol that have a sticky back on it, and you stick to the outside of your molar uh, before you go to bed at night, and it stimulates saliva all night. So that's that's been very popular. Uh, as far as the stimulating saliva with pilocarpine, uh, again, a big, not, not a big hit. Like a lot of people give up on it. It doesn't work if, it, if you're too far advanced and it causes a lot of sweating. Um, but some of the Sjogren's patients do hook onto it and like it. I mm-hmm. very rarely have anybody on the full four pills a day that they did in the clinical trial. And, and then finally, uh, uh, it's the care of the teeth and, and, and the parotitis. For the parotitis, the most important thing is to massage it once a day, to drain it, you know, from the angle of the jaw forward, uh, just to make sure the ducts are empty of saliva and they don't sit there and fester and turn into jelly and block things. Uh, so that's really important. As far as the teeth are concerned, the only thing that's got a modest benefit is fluoride. It's the only thing that makes a difference. There's MI paste and there's all sorts of other preparations but the only proven benefit is from fluoride. So you, you had actually mentioned the, uh, the glandular involvement. I'm curious about acute versus chronic uh, you know, parotid involvement. The, the ULAR guidelines do break it down into acute and chronic. And uh, I always thought of acute glandular swelling as an issue with stasis or superimposed infection. Um, but the guidelines suggest considering immune suppression in that situation. So is is acute parotitis in Sjogren's disease, is that an immune phenomenon or is that kind of a result of the stasis and, and dryness? Um, I'm, I'm curious what your take on that is. Well, my take is that it's usually due to stasis and dryness. Uh, I think they usually get uh, inspissated, dried out saliva that plugs the ducts and then everything piles up behind it. Or they get, rarely, they get uh, bacterial... Uh, Uh, bacteria sending the ducts. Can I ask a a question too, before we get into chronic prurititis, because that we might want to hear about too, just backing up towards the eyes. And I'm only asking to interrupt now because I think I'll forget later, but uh, for the eyes, there's, there's a couple things. I've never seen anyone do race stasis with Zydra. And I think for the people listening, Zydra is um, a different immune suppressant, different mechanism of action and something that we have no oral equivalent to. I've never seen them combine it. I'm not sure why not. Maybe cost, maybe they just don't do that, number one. And number two, I've seen more people lately, and I, I'm talking by the cornea specialist, not optometrist, not us, but the people that are really experts in cornea, sometimes trying to settle down their eyes, I guess, if they're really inflamed um, with steroid drops. And I never used to see that till the last few years. So I guess combining immune suppressant drops, haven't seen it, I don't know if you have. And also, have you seen that maybe there's a change in how they think about um, the severe dryness giving steroid drops to get things going? Yeah, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, we do. We use Lodamax or other topical steroid preparations. It uh, settles down the irritation of the eyes, and it does allow people to get on top of things. So, yes, we do use that. Uh, as far as combining uh, lefitograss, which is Zedra, uh, and uh, cyclosporin, which is the, the uh, stasis. stasis drops, uh, nobody's done it. I... I, I don't know if there's an advantage to doing it because I, I'm i not sure it really causes increased production of tears. Like I, I think it's for the irritation that you're getting. And they, and they sting, you know, <laughs> both of them. So maybe we'll do that trial, Janet. Maybe we could. <laughs> so sorry. Now I think we're back on chronic uh, parotid swelling in Sjogren's. Yeah, uh, that's where we're into. Dr- that's where we're into drugs and medication, um, and that's where I'm hopeful that some of the newer drugs are going to make a difference. Um, it's one of the outcome criteria for the clinical trials that we're doing, um, and um, I, I know that I've had patients who I've given rituximab 
uh, to for that in years gone by before we knew it quote didn't work I don't believe that but that's what they say um, and it had it had benefit and they and and there were studies showing that when you did serial biopsies you got rid of the uh, lymphocytic infiltrate into the gland so it did have benefit you know what's your trigger for considering immune suppression for that for that particular aspect of the syndrome and you know if rituximab quote unquote doesn't work how do you treat it what's your approach there so so for chronically uh, uh like for chronic parotomegaly uh r- nothing works like uh, we i've tried everything from um cyclosporin to um azathioprine methotrexate i i've tried everything on it i i don't think that anything works with consistency mm-hmm. so uh, I th- I think we need a new class of drug to work, and I, and I th- I think that the ones that they're playing with now, uh, the CD40 antagonists uh, and the BAF inhibitors, um, have a better chance of working. They seem to work on the SDI criteria, and I'm hopeful they're going to work for protomegaly. Any other treatments that are kind of in the pipeline that uh, that are under investigation uh, that you could mention? Uh, they're looking at a uh, intracellular signaling inhibitor. A lot of the other trials haven't made it past phase two trials. Mm-hmm. So you know, we've been through a lot of different agents, but there's no point. So they just they just didn't get past the phase two trials. Right. There seem to be at ULAR a couple of positive ones. Again, only early, or early, but decent outcomes that seem to be relevant to the patients, even helping fatigue, which is amazing. And one was some intracellular signaling thing that I don't understand. I can't remember as well. And I think the other one was a, a BTK. It's the first, like, BTK inhibitors have failed miserably in RA. And I think there's one that's kind of gone on a bit in lupus, but hasn't. You know, we'll see if they get into phase three. But there was a BTK inhibitor uh, presented, I think, both at ULAR and at ACR that I think is going to phase three. So I guess there is hope, um, different mechanisms of action, um, giving quality of life as well as, I guess, some objective improvement for our patients. That would be great. Yeah, there were some trials of Bruton kinase inhibitors that didn't work. So it's it would be good if they do have one. Um but yeah, and, and the interesting thing is, uh, with these clinical trials, you can influence the objective uh, SDI criteria, which are the um, which are measures of inflammation in various uh, body systems, like you know central nervous system, vasculitis, that type of thing. You can influence those a lot better than you can influence the subjective criteria called the SPRI. Uh, it's very hard to shift that. It's very hard to make patients appreciate that they're getting an improvement. That's sort of the golden goose. That's what everybody's trying to aim for. That's interesting. So some of these medications are are better at treating the disease than they are at treating the actual experience of the disease. Right. Wow. But I well. guess if you're if you're inflamed and dry and you still are atrophic glands and the inflammation goes down a bit, there's probably a set point where it's going to be difficult to have enough like um, tears or saliva. So I would wonder if some people are just too far gone. Too that, far gone. That's, right. That that's just... that if we got them, a, you know, we we don't, and we didn't yeah. have things that offer them back then, but maybe 10 years earlier yeah. that they might be doing something, which I think is a segue to um, where is it appropriate to think of hydroxychloroquine, um, Leflunamide, none of the above, both of them. Where, where, where? What are your pearls on? Oh, I use hydroxychloroquine beyond, I guess, leukocytoclastic vasculitis and inflammatory arthritis. Is there any reason beyond those manifestations to think of hydroxychloroquine? Thank you for bringing that up, Janet. Another <laughs> pet peeve. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's three double-blind control trials on hydroxychloroquine showing that it does not work for dry eyes, does not work for dry mouth does not work for fatigue. 
So those are not indications. So just making a diagnosis of Sjogren's is not an indication for hydroxychloroquine. It works for arthritis. It works for cutaneous vasculitis. Uh, it works for, you know, a few mild objective and organ inflammatory problems, but it does not work for the basic issues of dry eyes, dry mouth, and fatigue. <clears throat> so thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> If some of those manifestations may actually just represent disease that has probably been in process for years and diagnosing early on might, you know, putatively make a major difference. Uh, what are your thoughts on the value of this, the early Sjogren's panel? Um, are you um, impressed by any of the literature around that? No, I'm not. Uh, and that's why they uh, haven't been taken up uh, as... Uh, useful tests for diagnosing Sjogren's by any official uh, body around the world. Most of those most of those tests do not have a high enough sensitivity and specificity uh, to be usable, and they can lead you down the garden path. Can I ask a tough clinical question? Um, what do we do, if anything, because I'd love to make these people better, but uh, there's there's the stocking glove peripheral neuropathy where I think nothing works, but maybe we can give them Lyrica kind of drugs to help symptoms. But some of those um, neuronopathies where these people are going to fall over or maybe be in the wheelchair, and some of them are very rapidly progressive. Do you, um, other than, you know, throwing a lot of hope their way, do you consider IVIG or Cyclo or Retox or is there anything we can maybe consider until we have trials i don't think we're going to have trials ever specifically in that area but if we had a positive drug that looked like it was potent we might think of it but do you have an approach to some of these more severe peripheral nerve manifestations so these people that are falling over themselves they have ganglionitis yes and it's been shown uh it's been shown it's a true entity pathologically and with mri you can show there is inflammation and damage and atrophy of the uh, nerve root ganglia. And that occurs with Sjogren's with unusual frequency. Um, so it's, uh, yes, I treat them with everything. I, I hit them with steroid. I start them in IVIG. I've treated them with uh, my Fortic and Celsep. Um, I, I hit them with everything. I've had some response, like, uh, but they're, they are very hard to influence. Some of them are rapidly progressive and land up with ataxia and young people, young people. Uh, and then there are others that are very, very slowly progressive. So um, the ones that are rapidly progressive maybe have a, uh, I don't know whether they have a better chance, but I've seen a response in some of those. I find those to be particularly tricky cases when we see them or we're, we're consulted from neurology on the ward. If they have no ocular or oral sicca, they don't have any other overt symptoms of Sjogren's, may or may not be SSA positive. Um, you know, if that's an SSA negative patient, would you go on to a lip biopsy of that person, even if they don't report any symptoms and your objective, your other objective testing is negative? Is that someone in whom... Uh, a lip biopsy is is truly worth it because you might be able to actually you know achieve a diagnosis of Sjogren's. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. You know, like the current criteria for like the classification for for criteria were meant to pick up exactly these cases, these cases of un uh, uncertain connective tissue disease where nobody knows what's going on um, because uh, there are a number of these cases that have Sjogren's. Right. And we get consulted on stuff like that. They, they say it's not Guillain-Barre, something's going on. They think at the ganglion level and their RF is twice normal and their ESR is not sky high, but a bit elevated, ANA positive, but ENA neg. And that they're the people that I think we do get the consults on. And because I think it might help in aggressively trying to treat if it's in our wheelhouse, but also for prognosis, because um, it's pretty 
devastating a ganglionopathy and I, I i agree art that mm. you have more experience i'm sure than all of us combined who are listening but it's just so important to make a diagnosis and get on with something because otherwise i think um the, the outcome is just so miserable yeah i agree um so just before we wrap up i'm i'm curious if you have any other final thoughts for uh for the listeners I think finally things are happening for Sjogren's in terms of therapeutics. Novartis has got two drugs that have come out that look like they've, they're into phase three clinical trials. I think they're going to go to market. They may not turn everybody around, but at least they're getting at the basic pathogenesis of the disease, and I think they're making a difference. Sjogren's is a lot like lupus in that respect. It's very It's been very hard to make inroads. But I think we're going to get there. And I think Janet sort of hit the nail on the head. The earlier cases are the ones that are going to respond. And even with rituximab, we got in the earlier cases, we saw increased salivary flow in people that were treated with rituximab. And same thing's happening with these drugs. The earlier cases are the ones that are getting return of saliva. Can I ask one controversial question? (laughs) Sure. Uh, so the trainees ask it all the time, and uh, some of our trainees, in, in, in true disclosure, have come out of Toronto and come over to us. So I think the answer I give them might be different than the right answer, or at least an answer you'll give them. But uh, the trainees say to me, you know, we should be doing SPEP every year because we're co- trying to pick up their lymphoma. And I say, well, if they have a malt lymphoma, it's usually pretty obvious from across the room. And if they had a lymphoma in their lungs, I probably wouldn't pick it up other than I'd be following their ILD and imaging at times. And I go, I don't think there's many occult lymphomas you're going to pick up that are like no symptoms. So we tend, and whether it's right or not, we tend not to screen other than history, physical. If someone had B symptoms, we're obviously going to investigate uh, weight loss, uh, uh, pruritus, um, night sweats, things like that. But just a regular Sjogren's person, I must say I don't look beyond history, physical, and a decent physical, um, some routine labs. I don't look beyond on that for screening for lymphoma have I am I in the wrong and it's okay if I am it doesn't hurt my feelings and I might not still change my mind <laughs> there's a there are a number of clinical studies uh, showing that there are things that occur with unusual frequency before people get lymphoma so that includes monoclonal gammopathy cryoglobulins vasculitis is a big one people that get cutaneous vasculitis are in great danger of getting lymphoma uh, recurrent parotid swelling, uh, low complements. Yeah, those are some of the main things that we see. So what would your practice be if they don't have um, those things? So they might have, obviously, they're going to have a polyclonal. If their ESR is up, they've got a polyclonal gammopathy, and you've yeah. you've determined it's polyclonal. Um and they just, not just, when I say just, it sounds like we're, these are really symptomatic patients with dry eyes, dry mouth, but they don't have LCV, they don't have cryos, things like that. Should we just, should we look beyond now and then or mostly just go for our clinical acumen? Well, my, you know, I'm in the Sjogren's business, so my practice is about once a year, I'll, I'll run a series of tests. Maybe that's too frequent. I don't know. Uh, the vast majority of lymphomas are in the parotid and in the neck and are curable uh, unless you miss them. So uh, they are very slow and indolent in, in growth. And if you pick them up, you can cut them out and radiate, and it's usually a cure. Unfortunately, there's a few people that get really bad generalized lymphoma. I don't know if it's any good to pick those up early or not. So those are the ones that... You treat them when you can see it, you know. Yeah. Daniel, what do they do in BC, in Vancouver? Uh, largely, I think people, once they have a, achieved a diagnosis of uh, Sjogren's, are, are trying to do annual screening um, blood work for following their hypergammaglobulinemia, looking for cryos, um, you know, smear, looking for other features of lymphoma, but always uh, recommending to GP, but also doing it ourselves. Uh, a, a fairly, um, you know, extensive physical exam looking for that lymphadenopathy or organomegaly. And uh, we, we do try and pay attention to those risk factors for lymphoma. A- and I think something that you're driving at, Janet, is even if you find someone who has LCV, do you PET scan that person? You know, these are risk factors. They don't tell you someone has an active lymphoma. 
and and so that's that's kind of the rub how long does it predate the lymphoma uh, that can be that can be really tricky so luckily we have um uh, dr alice mai who uh, trained with dr bookman so she's running a sjogren's clinic at uh, the mary pack arthritis center in vancouver so I don't need to know the answer to that question. I get to I get to ask an expert. Yep. Perfect. Dr. Bookman, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, sharing your wisdom with us. We've been thinking about Sjogren's for a long time, and uh, it's great to finally have some of those questions answered. Good. I hope it's some help. And remember to do those Shermer's tests and that unstimulated salary flow. <laughs> I, I might have it. to change my ways after this and actually do some of the stuff or, or actually ask the trainees to learn it and they can do it. There you there, go. There it is. Your legacy. Yes. <laughs> Your legacy to me. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Around the Room. For questions, comments, and future episode ideas, email us at info at room.ca or tag our Twitter account with your questions at C-R-A-S-C-R Room. Around the Room is produced by David McGuffin, Dr. Dax Rumsey, and Aaron Stewart. We'd like to give a special thanks to the Communications Committee and the staff of the CRA for all their hard work. Our theme music was composed by Aaron Fontwell. If you enjoyed your time with us, please give us a rating and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. You can also share this podcast with your colleagues and spread the word on social media. I'm Daniel Ennis. Thanks so much for listening.